talk all the time about planting things, but we don't always talk about how to take care of them. So uh, I, I titled this Gardening Maintenance or Gardening with Nature, but my favorite title is The Lazy Gardener because that's how I like to garden. Uh, you know, the less maintenance, the better. And I think when, um, you know, it's like the carpenter's house, my yard is, it looks a mess. So I am always looking for ways to do things smarter, make it easier on myself for maintaining things um, so that, you know, like the carpenter's house, it's not falling apart. You know, he always works on everybody else's house, but never gets time for his own. So the carpenter's wife is never happy. So that's kind of my philosophy for gardening. Keep it easy. And one of the, the best ways to do to maintain your garden is to choose native plants. And, and I say that not just because I sell native plants, but because it's true. You know, native plants evolved here. They know how to survive in our climate, in our soil. And when you see them growing in nature, there's no gardener taking care of them. They just do what they need to do and they're beautiful for it. So that said, when they're in our yards, we want them to look a little tidier or to grow somewhere where they don't always uh, grow naturally exactly. But, uh, you know, we do the best we can. So we're gonna talk about a lot of tips tonight on how to maintain um, native plantings and, and a lot about this will apply to any planting. So if you have some tips or something that I haven't covered, feel free to send those in the chat to the Lorraine as well. And maybe we can um, get a few bonuses at the end because I am not the expert on maintaining landscaping and yards by any means, but I, I try hard. So <clears throat> just a little bit about, you know, natives, it's less time intensive because you're not spending all that time watering and mowing and fertilizing them because they know how to exist here. So this is a, a beautiful picture of a manicured lawn. It looks really nice. We've got our mulch beds there. They're very tidy. You know, somebody took a lot of time there to cut it in and pull the weeds. But when I see something like that, I think, oh my gosh, this spring or fall, whenever you decide to mulch, one, it's a lot of mulch. And two, that's a lot of work putting all that mulch down and keeping all that area weeded. So, you know, it, it's pretty, um, but it's a, it's a look. So think about, you know, having beds like this in strategic areas, you know, maybe right in front of your front door or somewhere you want that really highly maintained maintenance look. But then think about something like this where it's full. You know, there's not a lot of weeding going on here because every inch of ground where it could be mulched is full of plants. You know, they've got a lot of um, a lot of ground cover things in there. You can see, I think, violets on the lower left and some asters on the upper right, maybe. Uh, but the point of this slide is if you can pack it in, then you don't have to weed it and you don't have to mulch it. And I think that's a good strategy. They still have a path through here and it still looks as inviting, but it doesn't look quite as antiseptic as that first picture. So when we are mulching, because I do think mulch is valuable, um, this is a picture of what not to do. You should not mulch like a volcano. At the very base of a tree, that's where there's cells that need air and they take in water. But if they're constantly covered with water, you're gonna get root root rot and the mulch will hold in that water. So don't mulch like that because this is what you're gonna get. It's just not gonna look good. The tree, the roots will start to girdle and they will rot out and that area that needs air can't get air. This is probably my favorite kind of mulch. I wanna go back and talk, wait, one thing about mulch. Um, mulch does have a good place. Whenever you have new plantings, mulch is fantastic to mulch around things, keep the roots cool, keep the weeds down. And then, you know, as you figure out what to plant in there, plant things into that mulch so that you're not mulching it every year. So I'm not anti-mulch, but I do think you should use it sparingly. Uh, that said, the amount of mulch we put on our property in a given year is phenomenal. I can't believe how much money we spend on mulch. It's a big racket, you know, the landscaping industry cuts down our trees and then sells it back to us as mulch. Um, so right here, the green plants kind of in the upper 
center left are uh, heuchera, which is uh, coral bells. And the mulch here is just leaves. And it's really important to leave the leaves if we can. And a lot of times when I'm mulching, I'll leave my leaf mulch down there and then I'll put mulch on top of it because there are so many things that overwinter in those leaves like lightning bugs. And I love lightning bugs. And that was one of the things when I moved to Virginia, I wasn't sure that we really even had lightning bugs. We lived in a community, everything was mulched. Uh, the leaves were bagged up and taken away but lightning bugs overwinter in the leaf litter, and I think they're a biennial type insect where it takes them two seasons. So if we're raking up our leaves and getting rid of all of the lightning bug habitat, we're not gonna have lightning bugs. So leave that leaf litter there as much as you can. It's also the organic matter that native plants need because that's what mother nature does. It leaves those leaves and things break down. And you can see here, this is this is my yard actually, uh, not this year, but last year. And you know, there's in the lower right, you can see there's a Virginia creeper, which is a nice native. A lot of people don't like it because it just grows and grows, but I let it grow and it doesn't get too aggressive. It lets the other plants grow because they've evolved together. You can see there's some clover there and some random grassy things because I obviously was not great at pulling the weeds this year. But the heucheras there, the coral bells, look fantastic. You know, they're healthy. They've got all that organic matter decomposing around them, which is exactly what they need. And so, especially for native plants, the more leaf litter you can leave, it's the perfect fertilizer for them. So, leave your leaves. So, I just thought this was cute, you know. <laughs> Leave them there, the trees put them there, Mother Nature put those leaves there, don't rake them up. They're beautiful and they have a purpose. Um, I, and I think green mulch or living mulch is just the perfect way to go when you're mulching. There's two plants here. The one with the little flowers is, oh, I'm not gonna remember the name now, but it's a, a nice little native. And then the other one that is around the outside edges of that is American ginger or a serum canadensis, which grows and fills in very nicely around a tree. There's also a jack in the pulpit there if you can make it out. There's some Christmas fern. There's a oh, marginal wood fern. There is some, let's see, what is that one? They'll come to me after I'm done, but all these plants are filling in and there's no room for weeds to get in there and compete with it. And even if there are, there's only gonna be a couple. So you're not gonna be spending just a ton of time weeding. You're, you'll pull a weed here or there where they've managed to break through, but it's so much more manageable. Here's a couple more, uh, another native ground cover. I think I just moved that one picture up to the right. So you get to see it twice. Uh, on the left is our native Pachysandra. The Pachysandra that is variegated, meaning it has two colors in the leaves, is usually the Japanese variety. And it's aggressive and it takes over and it chokes out all the native plants. But this one, our native one, has one color leaf. Really pretty flower comes up in the spring. It's beautiful. And it stays this color all year. It makes a nice low growing ground cover, maybe six inches or so. So these green mulches or living mulches can save you a ton of time from having to weed. Here's two of my favorites. I think I talked about both of these last week in our talk. Um, favorite, favorite native plants. The left is Pacara aurea or golden ground cell, also called golden ragwort. Those little leaves that, that you see at the bottom at the base, the basil leaves, they stay all year round. It's evergreen, so you've got nice low growing green cover there and the deer don't touch it at all. On the right is Aster divericatus or white wood aster. It's a hardy self seeder. Both of these plants are very aggressive. So they'll fill in your area and provide a really nice dense mulched area. However, they both have fairly shallow root systems. So if they do get, you know, overstay their welcome or move to a place where you don't want them, they're very easy to pull out. So I wanna talk a little bit about pruning because uh, that's a question I get all the time in the nursery. When do I prune? Um, how much should I prune? And 
the answer is go to Google. And you know, people ask me that question. The first thing I do is I go to Google and see what do the experts recommend. I'll find two or three recommendations on how to prune this specific plant and kind of go with the majority. As a general rule, you can prune, um, if you want to prune to control growth, prune in the fall. If you want to prune to encourage growth, prune in the spring. Because in the fall, the plant is going dormant, and so it doesn't really know to grow. So you prune that off. It doesn't always, um, you know, the scars are healing over by the time spring comes. If you prune in the spring, the trees know, hey, I've lost something. And so they kind of overcompensate and, and grow like crazy. That being said, research what you've got and when to prune it and how much to prune. Some things um, like crepe myrtle, which is not a native plant. Everybody calls it crepe murder when they kind of top it off and cut all the branches off. But the trick is knowing that that crepe myrtle can handle that. You know, it, it doesn't kill kill the thing. Some people think it looks great. Some people think it look off, looks awful. But um, the trick is to know what your species of tree or shrub can handle before you prune it. So this shows you a little bit about pruning. And you can see on the left, uh, the branch bark ridge is a little ridge at the crux of the tree and the branch. And the branch collar, if you really look at your branch where it attaches to the tree, it's a little bulge right at the end. And the key is to prune it just above or at the edge of that branch collar like it shows on the right. A lot of us want to prune like it shows on the left, where it goes straight up and down, and you cut off that branch collar. It's key to leave that branch collar in there because that's where the growth cells are. So if you leave that branch collar intact, your, your scar from where you've cut off the branch will heal over nicely and way quicker than if you cut it straight up and down like on the right. And that's key because if the quicker it heals, the less chance you're going to get diseases and whatever into that uh, branch that you cut off. It used to be the school of thought was that you cut it off and then you'll paint it with, I don't even know what they use, like a tar or paint or whatever. But um, now they're saying that if you paint it, you can seal in the diseases if they're there. So it's better to let the air get to it and moisture and whatever. So cut at the branch collar and your trees will rebound much quicker and be so much healthier for it. And so here's a, a picture. This is, <laughs> both of these are in my yard again. Um, on the left, you can see uh, was a pruning that was done at the branch collar and it healed over really nicely, made a scar. And on the right is one where we cut it cut it off straight and didn't preserve the branch collar. And you can see that it's still decaying there and it's, you know, it's, it's a problem. So just a little example. Of, I'm sure I understand. Oh, that was my watch. Sorry. <laughs> All right. And weeding, we talked a little bit about weeding, but it can be really, really frustrating. Um, and somebody once told me when I was in Master Gardeners, you know, and I thought I knew everything and I was pulling weeds and I was doing my hours in the demonstration garden and someone said, Julie, are you pulling your weeds correctly? If you're not getting all the roots, you're just pruning the weed. And I thought, oh, you know, well, that I was one embarrassed, uh, but two, I was like, oh, that's, you know, right. I got to get all the roots out of there. But then recently I watched a talk by Larry Weiner. Um, and he said that if you just cut off the top growth, you know, that's where the plant is making its nutrients and whatever and how it sustains itself. If you cut off its source of nutrients, it's going to die eventually. So, you know, two or three seasons of just cut, cutting it off should, you know, kill the plant, which makes sense. But who wants to go cut off the same weed two or three years in a row? However, uh, we had a have, we still have a big problem with stilt grass, and we've been able to control it in a few areas by just mowing it at strategic points in the year. Stilt grass is an, um, is an annual, so if we mow it before the seeds fall, then uh, it seems to control it pretty well. But seeds can stay in there for seven years, so you really got to be, be diligent and keep on top of that stilt grass. Um, I tried this with dandelions. 
I'm only two or three years in, but definitely the areas where I've cut the dandelions off rather than try to pull them out by the root because I always break the root, the plant is way less vigorous. So I do think there's something into cutting that off. So you can try that in your own yard or try to pull all the roots with it. Um, and on the left, top left is a dandelion root. They have those long fleshy tap roots. And if you don't get the whole thing, the dandelion's just gonna come back. So it can be maddening. Um, on the lower, the bottom picture is a picture of uh, just violets, which I let grow in my yard because I love them. They're the host for the fritillary uh, butterfly and they spread, I think they're beautiful. I don't think we should be pulling up violets at all, but they have a, a long fibrous root and they actually have a little nugget or corn in there. So I'm not exactly sure what you would call it, but so, you know, you gotta get those important pieces of the plant out or it's just gonna regenerate itself. And the top right is, is a grass. I can't remember if it was silk grass or if it was a crab grass, but you know, they run and everywhere those things touch the ground, they're gonna put down roots. So if you pull some of it up, it's gonna be just like if you prune a tree in the spring, it's gonna say, hey, you know, some of my plant material is gone. I better grow more vigorously to replace that. So when you're pulling weeds, it, it can be helpful to know what the weed is you're pulling and what structure the roots are. But I will say in my yard, I just pull things out if they're not where I want them. And a lot of times I'll, I'll be pulling this weed out and what the heck, I can't believe this is here. And then I realize, oh, that might be a good thing. So research what you got before you uh, start pulling everything out. So when you're cleaning up for the winter, uh, you know, if, if I were a good gardener, I would clean up all my tools and put them away and um, be ready for spring. But the one thing that I really don't do as a gardener in my own yard is I don't do a lot of cleanup for winter. Let's see if my thing is going to advance here. It's waiting. Um, well, I'll just keep talking. So I don't do a lot of cleanup for winter because plants, um, the plants that leave their stalks up or have sturdy stalks over the winter, a lot of times are either one, great host plants, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or two, they're great food for birds. So this is pink muley grass. Um, it's a really, it's beautiful. You can see from the picture, it's got this pink poofy nests at the top. Um, it likes a well-drained, full sun area. It can grow in some pretty harsh conditions. This is what it looks like in the summer. And this is what I think it should look like all winter long. So when the snow comes, it's going to bury though that grass. Like, you know, you can get a couple feet of snow and that pink muley grass is going to be buried up to its neck. But popping out of the top are all those seed heads. And so when birds can't go to the ground and look for seeds or wherever, it's gonna have all this available to it. And so in the spring, this is what it should look like. So you shouldn't cut them back until spring. And that's true of so many plants. So leave them standing until spring. That way, if the birds need the seeds or whatever, they're there. Um, you know, this is a beautiful habitat in the winter. These people are going to see tons of birds enjoying all those seeds. And, you know, it, it looks pretty. It's a place for the snow to rest. It's another nice picture in winter. And you can see how the seeds are up right above the snow. So they're there and available for whoever needs it. This, I want to say this is my yard, but I can't remember or not. But this is echinacea in the winter. Echinacea's got great, great seed heads for birds. So this is the inside of a stem and a lot of our native plants have hollow stems. So I like to leave them up because you can see here there's cavities where inside there was probably um, a lot of our native bees and wasps will overwinter inside the stem of plants like this. This is um, a gall that a wasp has made and overwintered in there, laid eggs in there, and you can see in the center there's an exit hole, so you know that it's exited and it's safe to cut down this plant in the spring. Now, I know a lot of people will say, oh, I can't handle that, I don't wanna look at that all winter. 
a really nice fix is find a corner of the yard where you can leave this kind of stuff. Cut it down and then set it all upright inside a tomato cage so that it's upright and the insects still have their habitat uh, over the winter and they can emerge in the spring. And then you can chop it up and use it all as mulch. There's a little guy coming out of his, coming out of his winter home. And then the other thing for leaving um, all that debris or all of those plants up all winter is it's great nesting material. So it's, you know, it's providing food with the seeds. It's providing actual habitat by a place to live. And it's providing habitat because it's material that birds and can gather as for, for their homes. <clears throat> So a lot of people ask me when they come into the nursery and buy plants, they say, should I amend the soil? And my answer is generally no, you should not have to amend the soil. I think I said at the beginning that native plants evolved here. They know how to grow in our Virginia clay. So we really shouldn't be fertilizing them. We shouldn't have to add any amendments to them. Excuse me, they should be just fine. However, if you live in a neighborhood where it is so common and um, people have, or builders have scraped away all the topsoil, they sell it off to someone, you can go buy it back at Home Depot. But, um, you know, if, that, if that's happened, that soil there is not the soil that the plants are used to growing in. So you can add some compost or manure uh, or some sort of organic matter to help get it going. But, you know, once you do that, once you have organic matter in the soil, worms will come and they will start uh, making their own dirt and your soil will be healthy again. So I want to talk a little bit about problems that we see with plants. Uh, on the left, uh, there's a, a lot of examples of things that can go wrong with plants. And, you know, I can remember taking classes on plant pathology and what's wrong with my plant, and you start thinking, oh my gosh, my plant has this, it's like your hypochondriac. So I, I wanna talk about these, but generally they're kind of the exception rather than the rule. And things like, um, you know, you can get aphids or um, spider mites. A lot of those are fine. They are food for other things. A lot of, it's funny, I had a lady come in and she wanted to build a butterfly garden, great. So we sat and we, planned out her butterfly garden and picked all the plants and she planted them. And the next year she came back, she said, you know, it's beautiful, but I'm just, I'm not getting any butterflies. And I'm, so we're talking through things and, and I said, well, are you seeing any insects there? You know, maybe the plants are dying or they're not healthy. Whatever. She said, well, I have caterpillars and they eat everything. So I pick them off and I, I throw them away. I thought, oh, do you not realize that caterpillars are what become butterflies? So, don't kill the things because if you're killing the white flies or things like that, you could likely be killing caterpillars or beneficial insects that you want. And, you know, if there's holes in the leaves, great. That means you're providing food for something. So it's also a little bit of rethinking how things work. Uh, there are some plants like powdery mildew can be a big problem. Um, and there's, you, can, you can research natural ways to get rid of them get rid of powdery mildew, you know, can you put some uh, horticultural oil or soap on it? That'll take care of it. Some people like to put Listerine on it to get rid of powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is just cosmetic. So, and if you have spots or leaves, if you don't know what spots on the leaves, not spots or leaves, we do want leaves on our plant. Uh, if you don't know what it is and you think it could be a disease, the master gardeners have a clinic that you can take your plants to um, you can look on the Loudoun County Extension website and find their, their hours and they'll help you figure out what's wrong with it. And then you can decide whether or not you should treat it. Uh, the picture on the right, uh, a lot of people call those bagworms, but they're not bagworms. They are Eastern tent caterpillars. And we have a, or webworms, people also call them webworms. We have a spring version of this and a fall version of this. And it's really interesting. This year they were really bad. I saw them, they were all over in the trees. And now when you look at the trees with no leaves, you can see them hanging all over the place. It's a little crazy. Uh, but the, the very interesting thing about these are that 
they come out at exactly the time when our birds need that protein. So a great thing to do is you can cut the bag open and let give the birds easier access to get at those caterpillars. You know, I'll sometimes just rip them way apart and the birds will come, but you know, they, they can be unsightly in your trees. They won't kill your trees, especially the spring ones. I do think it's interesting. People will say, oh, it'll just defoliate my, my uh, Japanese maple or my European cherry or whatever. But on our native trees, on our native black cherry, they can defoliate the whole tree, but it doesn't kill the tree because they've evolved together. This is a very beneficial relationship and they will defoliate the trees and the trees, it happens at a time when the trees can regenerate, no problem. So then they get their leaves back and they look fine all summer. So it, it's an interesting problem to have. Um, when I was a kid, my dad would burn them out of the trees. Let's talk about, you know, that's the wrong way to go. So just to recap a few things here I wanted to talk about is plant native plants. Don't plant exotic or foreign things because they definitely take a lot more uh, work to get them going and think about whether or not you're mulching and where to mulch and be strategic. We talked about proper pruning, weeding, soil amendments. So I hit all the, the highlights. I'm going to take a few questions and then if we still have time, I'm going to go through some of my favorite plants here. Okay, the first question is, do you have any suggestions for ground covers for full sun? So ground covers for full sun, um, on this slide on the top right is uh, Phlox subdulata, and it's there in a very pale pink color, but it comes in like bright fuchsia and red and purple and blue. It it's the gamut. There's also um, Zizia aria or golden ground cell is a nice one that'll fill in, has really unique leaves. One of my favorites that I've kind of newly discovered in the past couple of years here is wine cups. Um, it's, I love it. Bright fuchsia flowers. It's really, really pretty. It grows very low to the ground. It spreads out. The only problem that I have with it is that it's only native in one county in Southern Virginia. So it's beautiful. I use it. I sell it. I, I love growing it. However, it, um, it's marginally native. So this is a good question with leaves. When you rake them into the garden, how much do you need to worry about covering up plants such as more meadow species versus woodland plants? So, you know, I've got an area where like down by the nursery among the rows, we kind of put all the leaves there for winter to protect the plants and give them some, um, some insulation. However, and then in the spring, we blow them all off into the woods and, you know, they'll be five, six inches deep, which I think is really deep. You know, you're walking through it and it is a problem to walk through. There's so many leaves, but, you know, a couple good rains, they, they sink down, they get lower and the plants come up through them. I've never had a problem of the plants not coming up. Sometimes it seems like they're a little slower than the areas that don't have as many leaves on them. So. I guess my answer is you, I don't think you really have to be too concerned about how deep the leaves are. And if they're too deep, when the rains come, the ones on the top, they don't get as bogged down and heavy and weighted down. They dry out quicker and the next, next wind comes and they're, they're gonna blow away elsewhere to probably somewhere that needs it better. So you don't have to worry too much. I mean, even things like this moss flocks that's really dense, they, it seems to come right through, no problem. Okay, uh, what happens if you don't cut back grasses and sedges in the spring? So if you don't cut them back, a lot of times what happens is, that, you know, they they lay down in the spring when we start getting more rain or sometimes the snow will just push it down and they kind of lay down. And so then you've got this flat thing and the new growth will come up from the center of it. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that brings me to another tip that we didn't talk about that, um, it's, I think a lot of people might appreciate is when you have those ornamental grasses, native or non native, you know, the, your clump just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you think, when should I divide it? When 
eventually you'll notice the center will die out. And that's a good key clue that it's time to divide. So I usually leave mine go until the center dies out. And then I will dig it up and I'll chunk it into four or six chunks, depending on how big the grass is. Put one chunk back in the hole and plant the other five or whatever elsewhere in my yard. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you think of them or you think of tips, send them on and we can, we can keep covering them. So here's a few uh, that are just absolute favorites in the yard. I, I think that, um, like when I say a plant is favorite, my favorite, it has to support wildlife, but it also has to be very reliable and look nice. Because I think that, um, especially, you know, so many of us live in HOAs that require you to have a managed looking yard that a plant has to look nice or it's, it's just not gonna fly. So on the left is Baptisia or false indigo, and it comes in a couple different colors. Uh, Baptisia australis is the more common, the blue one you see, and then there's a couple of different yellow versions, but that's Baptisia spherocarpa. And they grow to three or four height feet around, like a big, kind of like that meatball look. And they have a really clean looking foliage. The deer don't seem to touch them. And they get these really cool big seed pods, great green round seed pods on them that shake like a rattle that uh, rumor has it the Native Americans used to give that to their children as a toy. On the right hand are our two cardinal flowers, blue cardinal flower, also called great blue lobelia, the lobelia syphilitica, and cardinalis, which is the red cardinal flower at the top. Hummingbird magnet. If you want hummingbirds, you've got to plant these, uh, especially the red one. Anything red, the hummingbirds seem to flock to. But it's really, it's a reliable plant. And it's funny because it's one of the plants that, um, one of the native plants that isn't truly a perennial. It's biennial, so it takes two years to complete its growing season. And, but it's a hardy self-seeder. So I always make sure that um, I cut off just the tops and shake the seeds into the ground where I want them to be. So it's um, it's just really nice because it attracts so many uh, hummingbirds to the yard and some of our long tooth bees can get in there, long tongue bees can get in there to uh, suck out the nectar. Okay, I think I'm way ahead of my schedule here. What other questions do we, you guys have? I have a question. I'd All like right, to analyze some, some of my lawn. What's the best way to get rid of the grass without chemicals? So that's a good question. And it's a great one to talk about. I kind of focused on maintenance, um, but that's a good one for when you're planting things. It depends who you talk to. Some people will say, you know, you can get in there and tear up all the grass, dig it out, put down a little bit of compost and plant into that. Uh, some people like to solarize the soil where you'd put either a black or clear plastic on the ground and that will kill everything. Uh, I do both of those, or well, that, that one I kind of have a problem with because if you're killing all the plants in there by solarization, you're also killing all the microbes that could be in that soil. So not always the best way to do, but it is fairly quick. You know, it doesn't take long to kill all those. Um, I know one, one time we were cleaning our windows and we put our windows out in the front yard and it we had these nice little squares of dead grass in our front yard where it was solarized. Um, you can spray Roundup or something like that on the grass, but then you're adding chemicals to your yard, and I'm not a big fan of that. Um, my my most favorite way to do it is cardboard. I think you know we get especially at our house we get so many Amazon boxes, so I always feel good if I can be responsible about it and put it out in the yard. So I'll put it out and weigh it down with some rocks and put some mulch over it. Let mother nature take its course. It doesn't take, you know, a week or two of nice, some nice rain and that cardboard gets mushy and it chokes out the grass. I've done that countless times and it seems like it takes two or three years before the weeds will start to come back through that cardboard. Um, once the cardboard is nice and moist and mushy, you can go in there and dig out put your, strategically put your plants into little holes there. Uh, 
I am very impatient. So a lot of times I'll put down the cardboard, put down the mulch, get the hose out, water it down a little bit, then go out and I scoop back the mulch, cut an X into the cardboard and peel those little triangles back and plop my plant into there, into the cardboard. And it's a very effective way of getting rid of the weeds and it'll kill the grass. And, and uh, I've had really good luck with that one. Any others? Okay. Does Lobelia card? Oh gosh. <laughs> Cardinalis. <laughs> yes. Cardinalis <laughs> needs sun. <laughs> it does. Um, they both like sun. The blue one can handle a little bit more shade and they both like a moister area. Okay. Someone suggested that newspaper is good. Yep, newspaper, just make sure you're using maybe five or six layers in the newspaper to get it nice and thick. But yeah, newspaper's great. I never think of newspaper though, because I can't remember the last time we, how long it's been since we've gotten newspapers in the mail. I know, kind of sad. <laughs> um, someone's asking if there's going to be a recording. Yes, I am recording this and it will be posted on the Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube page. Um, what is today? Wednesday, maybe by Friday, but definitely by early next week. You're not going to watch it tomorrow anyway, because that's going to be gorgeous. So you got to get outside. And oh, I know. Really? See, see what's starting to poke through the soil. Yeah, it's a good time to take a walk around your yard and make some plans, right? Absolutely. Yep. I would like to announce before we go to, um, we have a couple more questions coming in, but okay. just to let you know, we have some more really great gardening programs coming up on March 16th. We're going to do something on the Pete Oldoff story, which should be really fascinating. His style of gardening is just absolutely beautiful. If you're familiar with Hudson Yards in New York City, um, he did those gardens. Uh, his, yeah, he uh, also philosophy. did, he did one in Chicago and he did the High Line in New York City. The High Line amazing. is what I meant to yeah. say. Yeah, just yeah. beautiful. And on April 28th, we're going to have a program called Design a Sunny Perennial Border. That should be great. Um, on April 24th, how to make an herb garden. And please do check for the Master Gardener programs too on our calendar. We have quite a few of those coming up. And now a couple of more questions. Will repeated cutting get rid of wild onions? Those are stubborn. They're hard to pull they out. Are. They are. Um, I don't know. I have not had good luck with that. The, the best luck I can have is mid to late spring is the best time to pull them because the ground is usually soft and they are at a stage where the stem is a little bit stronger and you can get the whole bulb out. So if you can strategically pull them at the right time of year, it's, it's helpful. Okay. What type of natives like rain gardens? So uh, there's a, a ton of different plants you could plant in a rain garden. And if anybody's not familiar with the rain garden, it's an area that uh, when it rains, it holds moisture. Um, it doesn't have to be consistently wet. In the summer, it can dry out and be dry as a bone. Uh, there's a lot of grasses that are good. A uh, little blue stem is really good in a rain garden. Uh, button bush is actually, a, a lot of times you'll find that growing in standing water, but it does good in a rain garden. Um, Virginia sweet spire, I've seen really nice in rain gardens and a lot of the asters in rain gardens. Uh, but you can, if you Google rain garden native plants, you'll get tons of them. If you come in, see me in the nursery, I have a little brochure that has a sample rain garden in it with um, a bunch of sample plants too that you could put in there. Okay, any other questions? Again, this is being recorded and will be on the Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube channel. Okay. And we still have a few more minutes, so I'm going to go through a few replacements for non-native plants. Uh, because if you can plant native, one, you're supporting wildlife, and it's so much easier to maintain. Um, on the left is a really popular lyrope, or lily turf it's also called. It's pretty, it's aggressive. A friend gave me some and it has taken me forever to get rid of it. But on the right is our native uh, blue-eyed grass, Sizirinchum angustifolium. And 
not only is it pretty, it has a similar stature. So it's maybe eight inches high or so, a similar color with those purple flowers, but it's actually in the iris family. And it's such a cool plant because those little blue flowers don't open until the afternoons on sunny days. So if it's morning or cloudy day, they stay closed and they open in the afternoons and the flowers are at the ends of those little blades of grass. And it supports a lot of wildlife, whereas the non-native Lyrope, there's a few pollinators that'll use it, but that's it. So you can get a lot more bang for your buck with the blue-eyed grass. Um, a few more th things to replace that Lyrope. On the left is just a, a, a mass planting of white-tinged sedge. And on the right is another seersucker sedge, which has got... Um, like a little ruffle on the leaves, if you look closely at it. But our native sedges are generally evergreen. They're little clumping, kind of in the grass family. Um, and they they are cute as can be. A lot of them will get flowers in the spring, um, but not flowers really like we think of them. It would look more like a wheat head, you know, or something in that, in that green family. But um, great replacements for some of those Lyrope. So lamb's ear isn't one that's really popular, sold in all the garden centers. And I find it popping up all over the place in my yard. I've never planted it. I, as far as I know, it's never grown here. Uh, it's neat because it has uh, a leaf that has some texture to it and it's really soft. That's the lamb's ear. Uh, but on the right is our native plant, uh, Antenaria neglecta, also called pussy toes because those little white flowers look like a cat's paw. And there's a, there's a Native American folk tale that says um, there was a cat, I don't know, I'm not gonna be able to remember it, I'm sure now, but there was a cat, well, you're gonna have to Google it because I can't remember it. I don't wanna mess it up too bad. <laughs> but Pussy Toast grows in full sun. It likes it dry. Um, it's a host for several butterflies, whereas the lamb's ear doesn't host any butterflies. So nobody I know uses it or eats it. So I uh, eat a lot more, a uh, lot more wildlife from that. English ivy grows, it'll choke your trees, it climbs up the trees, um, and the birds will eat the berries for that and spread it far and wide, but it will kill your trees. On the right is Tiarella cordifolia, or a native foam flower. And it comes in, I think we talked about this one last week as well. It comes in just like you see it here with the green leaves, but it also can get a mottled leaf or a variegated leaf and really heavenly smell. Really pretty. Uh, Nandina is on the left. That's one that I see all over the place here in Virginia. Uh, because it's an evergreen, it gets beautiful color in the fall, um, it gets berries, it's very pretty. On our right is our native witch hazel, and you can see the flowers of it there in the top right, and notice that it's flowering when there's snow on the ground. Uh, it flowers, uh, which I want to say late December into January, and the leaf picture here is the fall color. So that's a great way to add winter interest to your yard and fall interest because there's, I don't know of hardly anything that flowers in the winter. Another, um, another option that can place Nandina, but also burning bush with that beautiful fall color is our native Fother Gila or witch alder. You can see these white puffy flowers in the spring and beautiful beautiful fall color. It's a very salmon-y color. It's very vibrant. I don't think this picture does it justice, but um, that's a great replacement if you've got burning bush. I would say that's a good one to rip out because they do find it all over the place in the woods now. Uh, I was at Russ Nature Sanctuary last year, and it's rampant in the woods there, taking over. All right. Are there any more questions? Um, a comment here. Yeah. I think another perk of false indigo is that it's one of those kind of plants that add nutrients to the soil. Maybe nitrogen, if I'm yes. right? It's in the legume family. And so it has little nodules on the root that are nitrogen fixing. So 
it definitely leaves the soil much healthier than it was when it got there. And it can handle poor soils too. So you can plant it anywhere and, and you don't have to worry about amending the soil or anything like that. Is the first lure rope replacement evergreen? And what's its common name? Uh, so the first one, the blue eyed grass, it is not evergreen. It's, it was the Angus to foam. Yep. <laughs> Busy Rinchum Angus to folium. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's see if I can get back there. You guys are giving me a workout today. <laughs> Let's see if I can get there fast. Um, but it is not evergreen. Okay. Um, can we plant bluebells? Yeah, bluebells are fantastic. Um, okay. They are a, a spring ephemeral, meaning that they come up in the spring, beautiful flowers, but then they kind of disappear as the weather gets warmer. And so, you know, I, just, I can't tell you how many people have said, um, you know, I planted your bluebells and they died right away. Well, because they go away in the summer. So it's really nice to plant bluebells with ferns because once the bluebells are done blooming, the ferns are just coming up and getting ready to, to do their thing. Oh, nice. Uh, suggestions for shade rain gardens. Shady rain gardens. Mm. So that would be like shade and moisture loving. Yeah. Always ferns are, are great for that. Um, Clethra alnifolia or sweet pepper bush. Uh, it does good in moist to dry. So it fits that rain garden category where it can get wet in the spring and then really dry out in the summer. And um, it blooms in the shade. And it is probably one of our most fragrant smelling native plants that there is. And it's it's beautiful. It's white panicled flowers. And there's a couple cultivars that stay smaller, like ruby slippers, that actually has a pink flower to it as well. Um, some of the sedges, those shorter grasses do really well um, in the moist, moist shade. Um, not getting a ton coming out of my head, but uh, we do have our, our new website up and you can put in there moist and shade and see what list of plants you get back. Okay. I had the father gilla, but the suckers made me crazy. Can they be controlled? Yes, so there is a cultivar of Father Gila called Mount Airy, and it does not sucker nearly as bad as the straight species. It will sucker. Um, I do cut them off, but I have a Mount Airy park, park right in front of my house, and it, it does not sucker bad at all. But I think some of that too is, is planting some of that living mulch around it so it's competing. If you just have regular mulch around your plants, that's a, a beautiful environment for plants to send up new shoots. But if there's other plants there, there's not going to be a lot of space for that to happen. So, you know, that'll, that will help with some of your suckering if, if you don't allow it space to send up suckers. Is spice, spice bush a good alternative to witch hazel and burning bush? Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I mean, spice bush is really hardy here. It's the host for our spice bush swallowtail butterfly, which is one of the bigger, bigger swallowtails. Um, very fragrant leaves. You can always tell spice bush if you crush the leaves and it smells citrusy. It's one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. So in, I have a ton of it here, so I can tell spring is coming when the spice bush start to bloom. It's a, just a really pretty chartreuse color and it can grow almost anywhere. It doesn't like full sun, but you know, as long as it gets some shade, it does really well. And it's one plant has a really nice habitat. And if it doesn't have a whole lot of competition, it'll beautiful vase like very, it can be a specimen in your yard. That's a good, good recommendation there. Does rust on plants need treatment? Um, their service berry bush has it. So, yes, there are things that you can treat it with. Um, I don't think it'll kill the plant, but the, the rust that service berry gets is a cedar apple rust. And you'll have it one year and then not the next year, and then it'll show up every other year. It's a, a fungus that's passed back and forth between apple trees. And when it's on apples on the apple tree or cedar trees, it looks really nasty, but you know, it, it 
causes spots on your service berry and it can decrease the flowering. It is stressful for the plant, but I don't know if it'll kill it or not. Uh, thoughts on cultivars versus true native plants? So that's always a fun question. <laughs> you can get <laughs> some big debates on that. And um, depending who you ask, um, you know, it can be like discussing religion and politics, you know, probably something you shouldn't do with a lot of people. Um, my thoughts are that there's a place for natives or for cultivars. I think you should always plant the straight species whenever possible. The straight species is always best for pollinators, for whatever insect or animal are going to be eating the leaves, straight species all the way. However, um, I'm a plant collector. Sometimes I just like the unique color that they have, um, that they've bred into this plant or found in this plant. Uh, sometimes it's because it's taller or shorter and it fits my space better that I would use a cultivar. Uh, you know, so I, we plant for ourselves as much as we plant for nature and no insect has ever offered to chip in on a plant. So they don't offer to pay. So I, I'm okay to plant a few cultivars. I am a sucker for all the different crazy colors that echinacea or coneflower comes in now, you know, you can get green and tomato red. And so there is a place for cultivars, but, you know, even though I collect all these really weird colors of echinacea, I have tons of the regular straight species in my yard so that that's always available for my insects. Couple more questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. What method did you use to get rid of your Lerope? I, I pulled it. Uh, pure and simple, I just hand pulled it out and it took years. It took me maybe three years to really get it all out. And I had to go back and check that spot every year. I planted, um, what did I plant there? I planted black eyed Susans and I planted some wood asters because I knew that those are both two aggressive plants that as the Lyropi was coming back, um, one, it could compete with it, but two, the leaves were very different from the Lyropi leaves, so it's easy for me to identify, what, to go in there and pull the any Lyropi that came up again. Okay, and one more. Any low maintenance long bloom perennial you could suggest that would do well in a container? I love that question. So, you know, I always tell people, I said, they all do well in containers. I grow them in containers because that's how we sell them. Uh, but you know, some things fill a container better than others. And I think it's important to pair plants in containers. So, you know, um, a rule of thumb that was in Southern Living Magazine many, many years ago was when you're planting containers to do a thriller, a filler, and a spiller. So something that spills over the edge, something that fills up the middle, and something that adds a little bit of excitement that gets kind of tall. So, you know, cardinal flower is great in a container. It goes really tall. I, I put grasses, like little little blue stem in a container. However, you know, one year, and then I'm wanting to transplant it into my yard because it does get pretty big. Um, let's see, I, I like to put as my filler plants in there, Coreopsis. They do really well in containers. If the container's big enough, they'll come back year after year. Uh, some of the, some things like, I've put some asters in containers, but when I do that, you know, they, they can get kind of gangly and big. So we do what they call the Chelsea crop on it to keep them looking manageable. So if you start, you can do this for all sorts of plants, asters, um, coreopsis, uh, anything that's got multiple flowers on it, it would not work well for coneflower uh, or some of those things that have like just one or two flowers per plant, but you cut it back by a third. And, and then about three weeks later, you can cut it back by a third again. And that keeps the plant more dense. Remember how we talked about uh, pruning in the spring for growth? Well, you would start this usually, depending on when the plant blooms, but usually early June, first week of June, Monarda works great on Monarda. So Monarda, I'll cut the whole thing back by a third because it can get kind of tall and kind of gangly as well. So I'll cut it back by a third and then three weeks later, I'll come back and I'll cut half of it back by a third so that I've got some that's a little tall. And then this new cutting is about this big. And then three weeks later, I'll come back and cut another one by a third. So then I've got three levels of my Monarda 
and three different bloom times. So it prolongs the blooming. It keeps my plant compact and tidy. Um, I do this in my yard, but I also do it if it's in a container because it keeps it nice and tidy. So, so if you're growing in container, it certainly takes a little bit more maintenance. And I went to Mount Cuba one year and they have beautiful containers. And so I was talking to the gardener, you know, how do you keep these, these containers looking beautiful? He's like, oh, we replace them every three weeks. They put some new variety in there, you know, all natives, but you know, some natives have a quite a short bloom time. So, um, you know, it, it makes sense to swap them out, but that's not for me. That's too much work. If it's a shady container, I really like the coral bells or heuchera in a container because once they're done flowering, the leaves are still really pretty. And then pair it, you know, put a black eyed Susan in there so that you've got something in the, in the fall. So think about the different bloom times when you're planting your containers and mix and match. Someone suggested mountain mint and bee balm in containers. Yeah, both, both are fairly aggressive plants. Um, so they, it's nice to keep them in a container, especially if you don't want them, you know, their clump will get really sizable over time, but, and, and keep them trimmed back a little bit, like that Chelsea crop, like we were talking about, and they, they would both be really nice in containers and mountain mint. You can use in tea, both of bee bombs you can use in tea as well. So be nice one right outside your door and yeah. pick some leaves, dry them up. That does sound nice. Someone said, uh. She never thought to cut Menarda, but she did pinch off the bud blooms until near the end of bloom time. So that's another tip. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great tip. Pinch it back just like you would, you know, your mums in, in the in the fall to wait so that it waits to bloom. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Julie. This was terrific. No problem. Both of these programs were so useful and helpful. And I think you got us all really excited for spring. I know, and this warm weather is going to have us all chomping at the bit. I know. It's a little bit of a tease, isn't it? It, it is. <laughs> but it's okay. It's a little hope for what's to come. Thank yeah. you all so much for joining us. And please do check the Loudoun County Public Library calendar for more programs on gardening and also the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy website because they do such marvelous programs as well. Thank you again, Julie. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and we'll see you all next time.